So, good morning everyone and welcome to the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. My name is Kenneth Bo Nielsen. I coordinate the Norwegian Network for Asian Studies and we're very happy to be co-organizing this event with uh, NUPI. Uh, the theme today is the Philippines, ASEAN and climate change and we're very happy to have with us the Honorable Enrique Manalo, the Undersecretary for Policy at the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. And I'd like to thank the Embassy for enabling uh, this event to take place as well. Last year marked the 50th anniversary of uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, and the same year, the Philippines held the chairmanship of this organization. We'll be provided with an update on that experience in the first presentation by Mr. Manalo that will include some discussion of ASEAN's work in the field of climate change. Subsequently, we'll move on to an intervention by research professor Indra Øverland from NUPI, who is the uh, lead author of a recent report on the impact of climate change on ASEAN international affairs. I think a few copies are still available in print uh, near the door. Uh, the report can also be downloaded if you visit the website for this event. There's a link to the report if you prefer the, um, the digital version rather than the hardback version. We'll be given an, an update on the contents and key findings of, uh, of this report, bearing in mind that four of the world's ten countries most affected by climate change are in fact located in Southeast Asia. Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam and the Philippines. After the presentation, we'll open up for a Q&A session with interventions from the audience, and I'll be there to moderate the discussion. So before I welcome Mr. Manalo uh, and invite him to deliver his presentation, two important pieces of information. Kindly put your mobile phones on silent mode or switch them off during the presentations. And also, uh, the event is being streamed live via the internet, so you could keep that in mind uh, as well. So now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Enrique Manalo to present his speech. Please, welcome. Well, Professor uh, Overland, Mr. Nielsen, and uh, Members of the uh, Diplomatic Corps and ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good morning to you all. It's certainly a uh, great pleasure to uh, be here this morning to uh, speak at the uh, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And uh, as uh, Mr. Nielsen said, I'll be focusing uh, my remarks presentation on the uh, chairmanship of the Philippines last year, which happened to be the, the 50th anniversary. I'll, I'll try to um, uh, be as brief as possible and focus uh, more on the accomplishments of our chairmanship and uh, maybe a little bit on the, the work ahead under the uh, new chairman, uh, Singapore. But uh, first, just a brief introduction on last year's chairmanship, uh, just to say uh, that it wasn't an ordinary chairmanship because uh, it, was, it happened to, uh, to occur on the 50th anniversary. So that uh, put a little bit of pressure on the Philippines to, to uh, make it a successful one. Uh, but not only was it the 50th anniversary of uh, ASEAN as, in, as a uh, grouping, but it also marked uh, a number of uh, anniversaries were also held uh, with respect to our dialogue relations. For example, uh, last year marked the 40th anniversary of the ASEAN-US dialogue, the 25th anniversary of the ASEAN-India dialogue, the 40th anniversary of the ASEAN-EU dialogue. And uh, also we had the uh, 20th anniversary of the ASEAN plus three, uh, which is ASEAN, China, Japan, and, uh, and Korea. So there were a number of uh, uh, anniversaries last year uh, and certainly um, <coughs> led to a number of um, outcomes. But uh, maybe just to give you a general idea, the, uh, when we became chairman, the Philippines uh, theme of our chairmanship was partnering for change and engaging the world. Well, simply put, partnering for change meant working uh, for positive change for the peoples of ASEAN, whereas engaging the world, obviously, uh, we wanted to show that ASEAN uh, 
was an open, uh, was committed to open uh, regionalism and also committed to strengthening interaction with the international community, especially our dialogue and our sectoral partners. Now, uh, under this broad uh, theme, we had uh, six uh, priorities for the Philippines. One was to promote a more people-oriented ASEAN, uh, and of course, to work towards peace and stability in our region, uh, engage in maritime security and cooperation, uh, to promote inclusive and innovation-led growth, uh, to uh, promote ASEAN's resiliency, especially with respect to dealing with natural disasters, and to promote ASEAN as a model of regionalism and a global player. Now, under um, I'll just uh, indi uh, indicate uh, some of the achievements we made under these individual priorities. Under the people-oriented, people-centered ASEAN, the uh, ASEAN leaders, most importantly, I think, uh, adopted and signed the ASEAN Consensus on the Protection and the Promotion of the Rights of Migrant Workers. This was a um, document which had been uh, under negotiation for more than a decade, and it was finally, an agreement was finally reached amongst the 10 members of ASEAN on the promotion and protection of the rights of migrant workers. We also, the ASEAN leaders also adopted a declaration on the role of the civil service uh, as a catalyst for achieving the ASEAN vision for tw uh, 2025. That vision 2025 uh, more or less um, includes the, uh, the objectives and goals for ASEAN uh, with respect to the three ASEAN pillars by 2025. The three ASEAN pillars are the political pillar, the economic pillar, and the uh, social cultural pillar. With regard to our priority to bring peace and stability to the region, uh, the ASEAN leaders adopted the Manila Declaration to counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. We also witnessed uh, last year the entry into force of the ASEAN Convention Against Trafficking in Persons, especially women and children, and also uh, a Bohol, or that's a province in the Philippines, a, a uh, Bohol Trafficking in Person Work Plan was also adopted. Under the priority or thematic priority of maritime security and cooperation, uh, perhaps one of the major achievements was the announcement by the leaders of ASEAN and China uh, to commence negotiations on a code of conduct on the South China Sea. And uh, related to this was the adoption uh, by the ASEAN leaders in China of a framework uh, for the Code of Conduct on the South China Sea, which would be used as a basis uh, to begin the negotiations, which in fact have already begun. We also adopted an ASEAN-China Leaders Declaration for a decade of coastal and marine environmental protection in the South China Sea. Under our thematic priority of the inclusive uh, innovation-led growth, a number of uh, measures or activities were uh, actually adopted. I'll just go over very quickly on this. Uh, among the most important was the, um, the uh, completion of the focused and strategic action agenda on investment, the opera uh, operationalization of the ASEAN roll-on, roll-off, or rural route connecting Davao and General Santos in Mindanao in the Philippines to Bitong, Sulawesi in uh, Indonesia. We also adopted the uh, ASEAN seamless trade facilitation indicators as well as we, the uh, development of the ASEAN inclusive business framework and also the adoption of an ASEAN work program on uh, electronic commerce. Regarding the next uh, uh, thematic priority, that is the resiliency or ASEAN's resiliency. The leaders adopted a declaration on disaster health management. The ASEAN Humanitarian Agency Center uh, was operationalized to deal with the One ASEAN, One Response Declaration. And there was also a statement uh, adopted by the ASEAN leaders on engagement of ASEAN with the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies. 
we also uh, accomplished uh, or achieved uh, adopting measures in relation with relation to uh, biodiversity and of course the inauguration of a new um, ASEAN or ACB building headquarters uh, in the in the Philippines regarding the uh, next priority that is ASEAN cooperation actually this is uh, the ASEAN cooperation on climate change was actually part of the uh, uh, resiliency aspect and I thought that perhaps since we'll be discussing that today I would say a few words on what happened during the summit actually I, what I've been giving you are really the the major accomplishments there are actually quite a number of other uh, activities very detailed and I think um, it would probably take me uh, at least a couple of hours to go over all of them but uh, under um, climate change at Cheyenne our chairmanship also witnessed uh, some key developments and uh, this was mainly the ASEAN joint statement on climate change which was delivered uh, during the uh, conference of the parties of the UN framework for convention on climate change uh, the reason this is significant is that it was an ASEAN joint statement it's very hard uh, as those of you who might have uh, are working in groups to come up with a joint statement especially on issues such as climate change but um, ASEAN was able to achieve that and I should deliver a joint statement and also the um, uh, we uh, also have established an ASEAN working group on climate change meaning that uh, uh, climate change now is definitely part of the uh, ASEAN program now all of these actually fall within the third pillar of ASEAN I said that it was political economic but we also have the social cultural community pillar and much of the work of this ASEAN working group on climate change will fall under the ASEAN social cultural uh, community blueprint uh, just very briefly the objectives of this working group is to strengthen uh, human and institutional capacity in implementing climate change adaptation and mitigation facilitating the development of a comprehensive and coherent uh, response to climate change challenges strengthening the capacity of sectoral institutions and local governments uh, in uh, ASEAN in conducting uh, greenhouse gas inventory and also uh, vulnerability assessments and adaptation needs uh, another goal is to leverage the private sector and uh, the communities to have access to new and innovative financing mechanisms to address climate change and also to strengthen the efforts of the governments the private sector and the local communities in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and finally mainstreaming climate change risk, risk management and greenhouse gas emission reduction in sectoral planning and this would also mean in future um, ASEAN uh, projects and uh, uh, development objectives uh, turning back again to uh, another of the priorities of the Philippines last year was to promote ASEAN as a model of regionalism and a global player some of the uh, key uh, highlights here of, of measures and activities adopted during the summit was the ASEAN leaders declaration on the 50th anniversary of ASEAN and as I mentioned uh, we also marked the uh, 20th anniversary of the ASEAN plus three by adopting the Manila declaration the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution on the ASEAN's 50th anniversary and we also had a number of other uh, achievements which are you can see here one of them was uh, uh, at the UNCTAD United Nations Conference on Trade and Development where uh, there was a, there were a document was adopted listing the achievements and challenges in regional integration uh, using ASEAN at 50 as a model and uh, a number of other issues were discussed uh, there was also um, the DPRK the uh, the uh, ASEAN foreign ministers adopted a statement on DPRK uh, about a year ago and in every and in every communique or uh, 
uh, that was uh, eventually adopted during the past year, there was always a, a reference to uh, DPRK essentially condemning uh, DPRK for its tests and um, calling for denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. A chairman's statement was also issued on Myanmar. And uh, at the same time, uh, we accepted Turkey as the newest, say, um, sectoral dialogue. Maybe a uh, dialogue partner, maybe just to briefly uh, touch on the sec sectoral dialogue cooperation because uh, ASEAN and Norway uh, do have cooperation uh, under the sectoral dialogue framework. And uh, last year we held a meeting uh, in Manila with the, with the, the Norwegian delegation uh, in the context of uh, the ASEAN sectoral dialogue with Norway. And uh, priority areas of cooperation between ASEAN and Norway include uh, basically peace reconciliation and security, including disarmament and non-proliferation and non-traditional security issues uh, in accordance with ASEAN uh, processes and principles, cooperation on human rights, as well as maritime and marine cooperation we have quite a long list here, and we also have cooperation on energy, connectivity, trade, and private sector development, climate change and biodiversity, environment protection, as well as people-to-people -people, uh, cooperation, including education and culture. So, uh, as you can see, we have quite a wide and broad um, area of cooperation uh, between ASEAN and Norway uh, in the context of our sectoral dialogue partnership. Uh, now, those were the, um, and I, as I mentioned last year, we had a very fruitful meeting uh, with Norway uh, during the ASEAN summit. Uh, now, um, that more or less uh, gives, uh, I hope, all of you an idea of what we accomplished last year. But, uh, uh, of course, it's a process. Uh, we didn't solve all of the world's problems. And uh, I suppose the new ASEAN chairman uh, has that task of uh, concluding all the work which has to be continued. But uh, at least uh, there were some other achievements which I forgot to mention in the, regarding under the trade pillar. Uh, ASEAN also signed a free trade arrangement with Hong Kong. So that's also a, an important development. And last year in Manila, uh, the leaders of the ASEAN and, um, and our uh, six dialogue partners uh, held a summit on the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And uh, it was agreed that uh, they would um, provide the political momentum to hopefully uh, reach an agreement on the RCEP. The RCEP is the, would be actually an um, economic partnership between ASEAN and the six uh, dialogue partners with whom we have free trade arrangements. I think this includes Japan, uh, India, China, Australia, New Zealand, and Korea. So uh, if the RCEP can be adopted, you would have probably one of the largest uh, free trade areas in the world uh, uh, composed of those countries in ASEAN. So those were also some uh, achievements uh, during our chairmanship. Uh, just to give you very quickly, what Singapore now has to do is to implement what we have accomplished. And, uh, but at the same time, Singapore is also embarking among, I mean, uh, with its own uh, priorities, which are very much in a way connected with what uh, we uh, also pushed. Uh, Singapore is focusing a lot now on expanding ASEAN resilience and expanding its innovative capacity. And at the same time, it's stressing the, the theme of resilience and innovation, cooperation uh, throughout ASEAN and uh, across all the three pillars that I mentioned, the political, economic, and social, cultural. So maybe uh, I'll end my presentation there. And uh, I hope you probably have questions because probably I wasn't clear on some of the points. But nevertheless, uh, thank you very much. And um
and uh, certainly was a great pleasure uh, addressing you this morning. Thank you. So my name is Indra Ovlan, and I'm a research, research professor here at NUPI. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Undersecretary for the presentation, uh, and above all for, for visiting our institute, which is a, a great honor for us to host such a guest. Uh, we, don't have, we haven't had many uh, events related to ASEAN, which is, uh, um, which is kind of a a hole in the Institute's activity because ASEAN is uh, close to 640 million people and a very important part of the world. Uh, more people than in the EU, for example, and, uh, and uh, a region that is also growing much faster than the EU uh, economically. <coughs> um, I'm going to uh, present a report but, uh, that we have produced uh, just at the, at the end of uh, last year. But before I present that report, I present another report uh, which NUPI pro uh, uh, produced in cooperation with Columbia University and Harvard University uh, about the uh, geopolitical consequences of uh, the changes in the energy sector uh, globally. Uh, it's uh, one of the very first analyses of these changes which are coming up during the coming decades. Uh, and this report was one of the main sources of inspiration for producing this report, uh, which I will present today, which is not about specifically about renewable energy, but which is um, about climate change more directly and how it affects or may potentially affect the uh, international affairs uh, and uh, diplomatic issues uh, among the ASEAN countries and also with other countries, uh, neighboring countries to ASEAN and other interested countries with an interest in the region. Uh, with this <coughs> report has very many co-authors uh, and uh, uh, one of our aims was to have uh, contributors from all 10 ASEAN countries. So among all these people you will see that there are uh, co-authors, contributors from all of the 10 ASEAN uh, member states. The starting point uh, or one reason that we took an interest in this topic uh, is as uh, Kenneth mentioned in, in his introduction, that <coughs> ASEAN is a particularly uh, uh, vulnerable part of the world in terms of climate change. So you see here the, the, the colors on, on this map. Uh, the, uh, this is some uh, calculations that we didn't do, but that uh, German colleagues did <coughs> in the Global Climate Risk Index. Uh, and it shows that the, the, the darker the color, the more vulnerable uh, country is considered to be to climate change. And what we see is that in around ASEAN, there's a, a high concentration of darkness in ASEAN and in, in some neighboring countries. Uh, so as Kenneth mentioned, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam in this analysis are uh, considered to be four out of the 10 countries in the whole world which are most uh, susceptible to climate change, that will feel the the consequences of climate change uh, at a human level most uh, acutely. <coughs> and what uh, we found in our analysis is that one of the areas or sectors where climate change may play out uh, particularly strongly in ASEAN is in terms of international affairs, which is not something that has received a lot of attention uh, not only in relation to ASEAN, but generally we often think about the consequences for food production and so on, but not how all these um, effects of climate change have an effect on, on international affairs. And the reason why climate change may have quite strong effects in the ASEAN context is the very uh, unique geography of this region, <coughs> which has a... Uh, very, very large number of islands. Uh, we have especially two countries, uh, Philippines and Indonesia, which have thousands and thousands of islands. 
<coughs> which in turn means uh, that they have very, very long coastlines. So if you have thousands of islands, obviously you have a lot of coast. So anything that happens to the sea due to, due to climate change will have a big impact on such countries. Uh, in addition, some of the countries which, which don't have quite as many islands as the Philippines and Indonesia still have many islands, like Thailand, for example, and uh, they also have very long uh, coastlines on their mainlands. So coastlines is one geographical reason why uh, climate change may be salient in this region. Another reason is the very uh, some very intricate borders. So, for example, Malaysia, uh, which has <coughs> a border up here with Thailand, but then also a complex border here, and uh, also other uh, complicated borders, uh, which which mean that any any effects of climate change that affect the country that might there are more chances for spillover because there are all these uh, little intricate uh, borders. And another geographical reason why climate change may potentially affect international politics in this part of the world is uh, the great interest of major global powers uh, in the region. Uh, this includes uh, some very big neighbors, India and China, uh, and it includes uh, the US and the EU as uh, big blocks in the world which, which have shown some interest in the region and uh, potentially some uh, competitive behavior among among themselves, competing for for influence in the region, uh, Myanmar, China, and versus Western countries is an interesting case in point there. Also, Japan, obviously, a major power with an interest in the region. <coughs> so, these are the special geographical reasons why we took an interest in the question. Um, in terms of the consequences, one of the consequences of uh, climate change is flooding increased flooding. And flooding comes via several routes. Most of the current uh, episodes of flooding in Norway or in ASEAN and other parts of the world are in, in part driven by uh, uh, dramatic uh, rainfall combined with increasing urbanization. So some recent floodings have a lot to do with this, although they also have to do with the fact that the sea level is already rising, has risen between 10 and 20 centimeters already over the last century. <clears throat> now this isn't, this is more of a local uh, challenge. Uh, however, with uh, climate change during the coming decades and centuries, uh, the ice is already melting, the ice in the world, glaciers and the ice caps on the North and South Poles and the Greenland. And this is uh, expected and estimated to have uh, effective rising sea levels. Uh, if all of the ice on Greenland were to melt, uh, the global sea level would rise by six meters. If all of the ice on the South Pole melts, uh, um, the, ice, the sea level in the world will rise by 60 meters. Uh, that will take a very long time if it happens, uh, uh, but it already it is ongoing. And nobody knows exactly how fast it will take because there are uh, important feedback effects and there is there's a potential for slowdown, but there's also a potential for an acceleration of uh, melting of ice, which might lead to quite rapid sea levels. For example, by the end of this century, there are estimates of uh, over one meter. And uh, this, again, is a domestic problem for many countries, but it can also reach a level where it affects international affairs because people are driven to, uh, to seek uh, new places to live outside their countries. So then uh, you have a, a diplomatic and a, an intern a, a challenge of international uh, politics. And <coughs> the ASEAN countries are already uh, involved in migration as uh, exporters of migrants and as recipients of uh, migrants or, or, or source and destination uh, countries. So this is uh, something that uh, could have, uh, could, that, that could develop a lot more. Um, there is migration between the ASEAN countries and there is a migration between ASEAN countries and other parts of the world. And I believe in, in the fin Philippines uh, Foreign Office, uh, migration and the uh, overseas Filipinos is already quite an important aspect of, of foreign policy. Um, <coughs> one of the countries, probably the country, which is expected to be uh, most strongly affected by sea level rise is Bangladesh. Uh, 
Bangladesh is a geographically not very large country, but one of the world's most densely populated countries and one of the world's most low-lying countries. <coughs> and uh, it doesn't take a lot of uh, sea level rise to drive, uh, to, to necessitate a lot of people from Bangladesh needing somewhere new to live. Um, <coughs> Bangladesh was uh, part of India when it was uh, a British colony, then it was part of uh, Pakistan. Uh, so to split off from, they were split off from India, then uh, East and West Pakistan split off from each other, one of them becoming uh, Bangladesh. Um, so it's not clear whether Bangladeshis would be going in this direction. Uh, also, the, the eastern seaboard of India is also very densely populated, like Bangladesh, uh, and also has a lot of li low-lying areas. So there won't be a lot of extra space there with a the rising sea level. <clears throat> so the question is where... Uh, potentially uh, many million of Bangladeshis where they might end up. Ob obviously a lot of internal migration, but there isn't a lot of internal space. Um, and we already have some fresh ex recent experiences of uh, both migrants uh, uh, from uh, coming from Myanmar, coming from uh, potentially from Bangladesh, and of, uh, of this giving rise to uh, discussions between the countries in the region. <coughs> Uh, and of course, that those uh, incidents have been very small compared to uh, some of the potential incidents in the future. So I think this is a very uh, 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 interesting area uh, to analyze for future potential consequences of climate change. If we look further into the future, this is a map uh, made by National Geographic, by, made by some of the top uh, climate scientists in the world, and it shows the changing coastline. So if you can see here, for example, the, the light blue line uh, marks the current coastline. And the, the green parts is where the coastline would go if all of the ice in the world melted. Uh, and here we see some of the, some signs of the potential very long-term consequences for uh, international politics at a very fundamental level <clears throat> in, 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 in especially for countries such as Singapore. So uh, Singapore in this scenario uh, wouldn't actually exist anymore. So in terms of international politics, this is a, uh, uh, in terms of, in, uh, of, of the sovereignty of the state, this would be a very dramatic consequence. Um, this will take a long time to happen if it happens, um, uh, but even uh, going half, ending up going halfway in this direction or a quarter of this way is quite uh, uh, is quite uh, dramatic consequences for the the state system in the region and of course also in other parts of the world. And uh, uh, some of our uh, Singaporean colleagues, when we were working on this report, said that ah, but Singapore is a very advanced country, which is very true, very well organized, and has very good. Uh, uh, systems for, for building protection uh, from rising sea levels and uh, the, uh, the, the legal limits for land reclam reclamation, so when, when new land is built in Singapore, artificial islands or strengthening of islands, uh, the minimum level of this land has been raised, uh, uh, I think by a meter and a half recently, to compensate. But of course, uh, with, uh, if all of the ice on the South Pole melts, that's not going to help a, a meter and a half extra. It's, it could be very challenging. <clears throat> so that's uh, a very long-term and uncertain effect of, potential effect of climate change, uh, but uh, also potentially very dramatic. Uh, another uh, potential uh, consequence of climate change is stranded assets. Uh, stranded assets are uh, things like uh, utilities, power stations, uh, mines, uh, pipelines, and so on. So m major infrastructure, which where there is a sunk cost, where money has been invested, has been spent, and one expects to reap the benefits of this for decades, maybe half a century, in practice maybe a whole century. However, if there is a large-scale transition to other forms of energy, 
Uh, and if uh, countries do fulfill their uh, international commitments under the Paris Agreement, uh, many of the current assets existing in many countries, also many countries in Europe uh, and in, in the US, and also in ASEAN, and many much of the infrastructure that is now being built uh, may not be very valuable. So this is, uh, and this in ASEAN includes a very rapid expansion of coal power plants at the moment. ASEAN is the, the center of the world for building coal power. So for example, China is scaling back. In the meantime, uh, Chinese and Japanese and Australian uh, companies and institutions are very involved in building new coal power capacity uh, in the ASEAN countries, including in, in the Philippines. So one worry uh, at an economic level is that some of these assets may not uh, be very uh, um, economically viable in the long term. In terms of international politics, uh, what, I mean, what I mentioned now is about stranded assets is an is a, is a economic concern for the countries in the region, potentially. Um, in terms of international politics, what we found in our report with, with Harvard and Columbia that I mentioned at the beginning is that um, whole countries might be affected. So this might be uh, relevant for the major fossil fuel uh, producing countries in the region, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Indonesia to some extent, uh, Vietnam to a lesser extent, uh, and, and other countries like Philippines and Myanmar, which, which are working on developing oil and gas resources. Um, uh, it is uncertain, there is an uncertainty hanging over these resources and how valuable they will be and any investments that are done in them now will be in the future. And this could, in, in the ca cases of countries which are very dependent on uh, oil and gas exports or coal exports as in a more short term, um, it could affect their standing internationally, both in terms of status and in terms of their, their economic strength and uh, geopolitical strength. I mentioned some possible uh, risks related to climate change and international pol politics in the region, but um, there are also, of course, some potential uh, positive aspects. Uh, one of them is that by reducing their dependency on fossil fuels, uh, a, and not investing so much in their development, the countries uh, in the region and in other parts of the world uh, can reduce their import dependency, so, which means that they increase, increase their energy security. So ASEAN has, is increasingly becoming dependent on energy imports. Uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, was one of the key members of OPEC historically, uh, but is today a net importer of oil. Uh, although it still has some oil production, it's not enough to cover domestic needs. So by uh, fulfilling <coughs> its um, commitments under the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, countries like Indonesia and other countries in the region can ensure that they don't become uh, a dependent on imports of oil and ultimately gas maybe for some countries, uh, from other parts of the world, including unstable parts of the world. This is, has a significance for energy security. It has a, a, a significance for uh, the trade balance and the economic interests of the country. And it has uh, uh, um, implications for uh, dependency and stability, <coughs> as uh, many imports are coming increasingly from the Middle East. And we see here a country even like Brunei, which is a very large net exporter of energy, uh, is, however, the, the trend points that in, in not very many years from now, Brunei will no longer be a uh, net exporter if the current trend continues. And we see several of the other countries are already close to uh, being net importers. Another uh, positive aspect of climate change for international affairs in the region uh, is that it provides many opportunities for cooperation. Uh, there is already a history of trying to deal with the famous haze, which is the, the smog from uh, forest fires, which is transboundary and which the countries have tried to deal with, among other things, through, through ASEAN 
uh, mechanisms. So this is one track record of, of, of working together to try to solve uh, transboundary environmental issues. <coughs> there is uh, also a possibility to develop greenhouse gas emissions trading schemes, uh, uh, such as the EU has. The EU system is not very successful so far, uh, but it's considered to be one of the main options. Um, there is a potential for a integration of electrical grids, which could become more important as, as climate policy leads to increasing electrification, and uh, the increasing use of renewable energy leads to the challenge of intermittency, uh, which is uh, the fact that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, uh, and therefore the, you can get a lot of electricity increasingly cheaply from renewable energy, but it's not always stable. Uh, this is intermittency, and one of the ways of solving that is to integrate the grids between countries so that when one country has a bigger supply of electricity, it can share with another country, and uh, vice versa. Part of this is the possibility for developing so-called green batteries. Uh, this is interesting for countries with a big uh, hydropower potential, such as Laos, such as Myanmar, uh, which could potentially uh, use their dams to, to supply electricity to neighbors, uh, when the neighbor's renewable energy uh, isn't so productive. Uh, and the advantage of hydroelectric dam is it's, it's renewable uh, and you can switch it on and off in a matter of minutes. There are <coughs> uh, also, uh, in the extension of this, you have uh, something called pump power, uh, which is where you use renewable energy, such as wind power, for example, to pump uh, water up into a dam as to store it there as a battery. Um, another potential uh, or expansion of this green battery concept. Another area of potential cooperation is to coordinate and cooperate within ASEAN on the uh, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, this is something suggested by our colleagues uh, the, who have contributed to the report from the ASEAN countries that there could be scope for more uh, further cooperation uh, there, potentially even to develop a, uh, a regionally determined uh, contribution under the Paris Agreement to, to kind of sum up the national ones into a, a team effort. Wrapping up, uh, just come back to the, the report itself. One of the aims of this report isn't really to do fundamental uh, research, but to highlight uh, some of the challenges and to show that climate change isn't just a natural science issue. It has social implications and it even has potential implications for uh, uh, for international politics and for uh, diplomats, um, <clears throat> and some of these can some of these are happening already. Some of these are not happening yet, but are potentially uh, quite uh, important. Uh, and being aware of these things at, at, at different levels of society, different ministries is 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 important for for mobilizing the will to do something about climate change. And that's also one of the reasons why we brought in so many authors, why we have authors from all 10 ASEAN countries, uh, 13 different institutions, and actually 23 different people, mo almost all of the vast majority of them uh, from the region, uh, because we see the, the, the authors as a network in itself. Uh, and uh, what we've seen is that this has been, uh, this, is wor this little experiment in, in very expansive co-authorship has worked and the report has been spread very, very extensively compared with a lot of other research that we do. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Indra. Thank you, Undersecretary, for two very rich and thought-provoking presentations. Uh, I'm sure this will uh, provoke a number of questions and comments uh, from from the audience. Uh, just to to get us uh, get us going, um, two rather broad uh, questions that I'd like your reflections on. Um, First, the other dark red spot on Indra's map was, of course, uh, South Asia, which is right next door. Uh, not just uh, Bangladesh experiencing sea ri uh, rising sea levels, but also India and Pakistan experiencing 
uh, water stress across uh, large areas. And of course, historically, there's been very close connections between South and Southeast Asia. Um, what potential do you see for increased cooperation between South Asia and SARC and ASEAN or the South East Asian countries? Because this seems to be a, a shared challenge that, of course, spills over uh, regional borders. Um, that's that's the the one the one question. Uh, the the second concerns um, the uh, relation or considering climate change as part of the social and part of the cultural, as it was presented in the in the ASEAN strategy. Uh, one could argue that there are also important political and economic aspects to climate change. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how ASEAN is positioned to also engage perhaps more difficult questions concerning the politics and economics of, of climate change. Um, if you have a, some few reflections on this, and then afterwards I'm happy to open up for, for questions and comments yeah, from the audience. The yeah, I, my, my thought was that in a sense uh, it, it's very important to see uh, the, the social and practical implications of climate change. But there are, of course, also important political economic drivers that implicate how climate change unfolds. And I was wondering how ASEAN is positioned to also have discussions on these perhaps more challenging aspects that have to do with economic development and, of course, the, the politics of, of relating to climate change as a challenge that affects uh, society at large. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I maybe I'll start with the uh, the first question on uh, cooperation with uh, South Asia. Well, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, ASEAN itself uh, has and India are dialogue partners, and um, uh, that I think already provides a great opportunity for the ASEAN and India to discuss issues, for example, related to climate change. But I think. Uh, to be very frank, discussions have not really gone down into that kind of level in the dialogue. We, we of course, are discussing the effects of uh, climate change uh, in, in some of the discussions. But um, as for any concrete uh, activities, I, uh, we have not really gone down to that uh, extent yet in the ASEAN-India dialogue. Of course, they're on the uh, experts level. There have been discussions, perhaps, but uh, lots of it is... Um, focused uh, really on, on more of the um, uh, economic and, and political cooperation. But definitely, uh, climate change is now gaining more and more um, visibility in the discussions. Uh, that's with India. Uh, ASEAN and SARC are not really, at the moment, having any um, what you'd call regular dialogue. I think at the moment, even, I think SARC at the moment is, um, uh, I think, going through some issues. So. Uh, much of our dialogue with any SARC member is th with India in terms of the, because we are dialogue partners. But um, uh, Bangladesh and uh, is also part of the, uh, what we call the East uh, Asia Summit. And there, uh, uh, and the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, I think the ARF. So uh, there are, there is, and Pakistan is also in the ARF. So there are, uh, discussions there, uh, but I really have to, at the moment, they're really, uh, when it comes to climate change with the other regions, really more at the general level. I don't think there's been any real, um, what I'd say, uh, active cooperation, but I think really the aim now uh, in ASEAN and when we talk is to get greater awareness. I think that's the, the first step, so it can get into the agendas of the, uh, of the uh, but I'm not saying, uh, Individual countries are not acting, we definitely are, but I'm, I'm speaking really more on the regional level. And I think the real challenge here is how to create uh, greater awareness and uh, get it into the agenda of the regional discussions. But individual countries are, are working, and uh, but an ASEAN-wide uh, point, uh, at ASEAN, we, as I mentioned, we already have a working group dealing with this, so, but as dealing with other regions, I think um, uh, work still has to be done. Maybe I could, uh, I could, uh, I, th I, I agree very much with your uh, point that the awareness building is the first step and there is a need for more of that. I, I wonder if I could take your question then and throw it at you again in a, in a slightly broader version. 
uh, ASEAN has a very, I see ASEAN as quite successful. Some people see it as a bit slow, but I see it as very successful in its, in its cautiousness. It's a very, it's the long game, um, in, in my impression. Um, but I wonder if for climate change and also for, for other areas, um, ASEAN might, of course, be, it could potentially be more hard hitting. Uh, and then it might need to be a little bit less internally cautious and diplomatic. Um, I'm not saying it necessarily should be because it works quite well how it's been operating. But so m my question is, uh, which I think is a version of what you were saying, is is ASEAN, is there any change? Is ASEAN becoming a little bit more I integrated, a little bit less cautious about uh, treading on each other's toes? Um, on the many different issues that come up? Or is it maintaining its very diplomatic, cautious, non-interventionist stance? Well, I think uh, on, that, on that particular point, uh, it was stressed that ASEAN has uh, not only survived, but has succeeded over the past 50 years through uh, some basic principles. The one is decisions are made by consensus. In other words, uh, all the members of ASEAN, if there's to be any particular line of action or anything to be adopted, uh, it has to be adopted by consensus, which then in itself means uh, we try and, um, and see uh, or get positions which are, um, let's say, which every member can, can live with. And uh, related to that is the basic principle of non-interference in, uh, in the affairs of the members of ASEAN. So uh, given those two broad principles, uh, whenever ASEAN is faced with particular issues, uh, it has to do it in a way where every member uh, can live with whatever is adopted and doesn't feel as if uh, the ASEAN is ganging up on it or trying to intrude into its personal affairs. Now, um, that's why uh, in the case of ASEAN decision making, one has to be very patient because you're constantly negotiating to find the, the uh, the best, I wouldn't say the lowest, but the best uh, common denominator uh, where everyone uh, can accept. So if you have critical issues, for example, it's always like that. You try and take into account the views of all the members. And I think that's been the secret of the ASEAN success because you have to remember that uh, ASEAN uh, is, uh, region, uh, is in a region where, we, of course, you have 10 countries, uh, relatively small countries, of course, I think growing, but we are uh, in the presence of major powers in our region, that's China, uh, the United States, uh, Japan, uh, India, and even Russia. And, and our job is how to survive and succeed uh, in the shadow of that uh, daily rivalry. And I think that's where ASEAN's, uh, that's where the importance of consensus lies, because as long as ASEAN can maintain its unity, uh, we really provide a basis where hopefully um, uh, the other major powers uh, can work with ASEAN and in that way also manage whatever uh, rivalry they have. So in that sense, the ASEAN uh, decision-making process is, uh, is very useful. Of course, there have been calls for changes uh, in the way we work to speed up and maybe doing away with the consensus, but I think ultimately um, at the moment uh, that method is, is, is still being maintained and it has proven to work. I'm not saying it's going to work for the next uh, 100 years, but at the moment, that's how it um, seems to be working. And I, I think, uh, but at the same time, ASEAN is open to the views of others. We have those forums now, the East Asia Summit, as I mentioned, the ASEAN Regional Forum, which consists of all other uh, countries or most countries in the region, even outside the region, even EU. So I think in that way, we provide a forum where everyone can exchange views and at least identify if not uh, actually adopt measures, identify areas where cooperation is possible. Good, so thank you. Um, I'd like to open up for, for questions or comments uh, from the audience. Thank you for very interesting talks. I, I listened to part of your talk uh, 
while I was on my way here, since they had it live on YouTube, and I got most of your talk, I missed a little of it. Um, I am, so I'm from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, working on climate and health, climate change and health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And my question is a little um, removed, but maybe still relevant here. The WHO, in its recent presidency with Theodros, has identified climate change and health as one of its top priorities, with particular focus on sea level rise, and uh, small island nations. And um, I've been to sessions before where I know that the Philippines, for example, is very active in mobilizing the health sector um, uh, with re regards to disaster management and uh, potential climate change. And so a question would be on how you see ASEAN and the region in general taking this forward and what, what are your views uh, with relation to the new WHO priorities? In the uh, yes, thank you very much. Well, first let me again uh, repeat what I said earlier. I think uh, every individual ASEAN country is, is quite aware uh, at working in its own way in addressing climate change. So I think the real challenge is how to develop a regional uh, approach. And uh, I, um, I think earlier when I, I mentioned uh, many of these issues are already uh, on the agenda in ASEAN, at, the, at least at the expert working group level. And the idea now is to see uh, if the experts then can come up with the appropriate recommendations, but then that will have to go up to the uh, the senior official and then the um, the uh, uh, ministerial level. And uh, as I said, that falls really under the right now climate change issues and health issues are under the social cultural pillar. Uh, that's distinct from the economic and the political. But um, as I, uh, I really think that. Um, Eventually, uh, the issue will boil, will seem, uh, will of course um, get into the economic and the political. And that's why I, I really feel that uh, uh, the awareness question, uh, the awareness issue is really very important so that it gets into the, into the, um, into the uh, thinking of the decision makers within ASEAN. And I, I, uh, I'm just saying now that perhaps um, there has to be, uh, it has, we have to go through the ASEAN process before it, it gets there. But I mean, definitely the issue of climate change is, is considered to be one of the uh, biggest non-traditional security issues in ASEAN at the moment. So it's really, really a matter of time when this issue can get into the, uh, eventually to the leaders. And then once they give us the, the go ahead, then specific measures could be taken. But it has to go through the, uh, the ASEAN process. But again, the individual countries are already in their very own ways taking uh, action. For example, in the Philippines, as you mentioned, we're very active in this. But um, I was looking really more at the ASEAN in this context. Thank you for your interesting presentations and reports. So uh, maybe my question is not too much relevant to the climate change problem as it is, but still it's interesting within the ASEAN, uh, speaking about the cooperation of your countries in dealing the, uh, with the climate change problem. Uh, it's clear that much is done at the level of state cooperation, cooperation between states, between governments. But speaking about the level of civil society, maybe uh, you can give some examples for us of uh, the international cooperation within the Asian countries uh, at the level of civil society. Maybe some non-governmental organization or something like that, uh, meaning the, uh, cooperating in dealing with the climate change problem. Well, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I, I didn't present myself. My name is Yulia, I'm from Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, well, ASEAN has um, uh, established the practice where uh, on, on various issues, it's, it devotes uh, during, sometimes during the summit or the foreign minister's meeting, uh, dialogues with uh, civil society. And uh, these can range from dialogues with uh, uh, members of the civil service or uh, NGOs dealing with human rights and uh, or even on, uh, even now, maybe even the possibility of those dealing on disarmament issues, NGOs, etc. And uh, 
in at least in the couple of years I've been there, we haven't had any real dialogue, uh, formal dialogue on, on with the NGOs on climate change. And perhaps maybe that's one, one area which could be uh, explored. But uh, I'm speaking more from the viewpoint of a practitioner. Uh, if you want to get your message through, you have to get it uh, to the decision makers in ASEAN. Unfortunately, ASEAN meetings normally last about two days or one day. And they're discussing a uh, typical ASEAN agenda uh, would probably have about 30 to 35 issues. And our ministers are expected to decide on one minute on each. But uh, what we're really trying to do here, uh, at least especially during our chairmanship, was to try and get uh, more interaction with civil society. Uh, it's already there, but uh, the thing is to find uh, enough time to have a really uh, real quality discussion. And uh, normally at least 30 minutes. But I think uh, really that's the way forward uh, in, in so far as civil society. But as I said, at the working group level where ASEAN already has established a group on climate change, um, each individual country is already in touch with their own civil society groups. And they, like in the case of the Philippines, bring those views forward in the discussions at the working group level. So I think uh, uh, it's there, but I, I agree that perhaps uh, we have to explore more ways where we can get the views of, the, of civil society on this uh, very important topic. Uh, this may not be very, uh, very fair. <laughs> so, if you, uh, but I, 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 there's one question I'm interested in. I know a lot of people are interested, in. it's not really our topic today. But it, and it may be tricky for you. But I'm wondering about the South China Sea, um, maybe from an ASEAN perspective or maybe from a Philippine perspective. Uh, can you say something about where, how this is evolving? Um, the sea or the well well first maybe I, I can look at the uh, environmental aspect uh, just to say that uh, uh, I think I mentioned in my presentation that the ASEAN and China have agreed on to uh, to undertake marine uh, environmental cooperation uh, in the South China Sea over the next 10 year period so that's been a uh, an important uh, accomplishment uh, insofar as uh, dealing with environmental issues and uh, and uh, this has been adopted uh, at the highest level this cooperation of course we will still have to develop the program but on the uh, issue of the the South China Sea well of course uh, uh, maybe if I could uh, start back a few years ago we uh, the Philippines um, instituted a uh, arbitration case against China which uh, uh, we actually won, but we decided not to to uh, to uh, make a, a big issue out of this in front of China. We we have now opted to have a diplomatic approach uh, to try and uh, uh, well, if we can't resolve the issues immediately because this may take a long time. These are all disputed territories. We have to find a way of how to manage our relationship and manage the disputes in a way that we avoid a, a conflict. Because the, the whole idea here is that um, uh, we recognize we have disputes, but we s I don't think any country at this stage would want to have a conflict in the South China Sea because that would not only involve the claimants, four of whom are from ASEAN and China, but it, it will bring in the big powers and we really don't know where that will lead. So the whole idea now is to recognize we have a dispute and to try a non-confrontational diplomatic approach. And I, I think I mentioned in my... Um, presentation that uh, one of the uh, major achievements during our chairmanship last year was the adoption by ASEAN and China of a framework on a code of conduct for the South China Sea uh, and, and essentially a decision to begin negotiations for a code uh, of conduct and uh, those negotiations have already begun and uh, we've already had our first meeting and we'll have another one uh, in a couple of months. And the whole idea of the code is to ensure that um, while we recognize their disputed islands or, or uh, features uh, in the South China Sea, the whole idea is that uh, uh, we need to have certain rules of engagement uh, to manage uh, how we will um, uh, undertake our day-to-day -day activities in the South China Sea and find ways of addressing any um, mishaps or uh, 
unforeseen uh, events uh, to see how we can manage them so they don't they don't increase tension or lead to conflict and that's the whole idea of the code to come up with certain uh, rules or um, uh, rules of engagement where each which each country would follow uh, and also what to do in the event certain things arise for example a collision sea or uh, chasing away fishermen uh, we have to have certain rules of how to deal with that so that it doesn't escalate and I think that's what we're working on now and the good thing is that it involves all of ASEAN and China and that's a big uh, step forward uh, we've been talking about a code for 20 years now we're actually beginning to negotiate the code now I'm not saying we will finish this year but certainly the important thing is that uh, uh, we're all now actually negotiating on a code so I think that's where we stand on South China Sea the I believe the uh, diplomatically the situation has has uh, improved a bit of course there's still events uh, going on but diplomatically uh, we're now trying to see how we can at least create more confidence and trust in each other so at the appropriate time uh, hopefully uh, with all these in place we might really be able to discuss the actual dispute but I think you have to uh, lessen the mistrust or create more trust before you can really begin to address the real issues so that's more or less I'd say that's where we stand now uh, insofar as South China Sea is concerned if I may just go back to one of the first things you brought up in your presentation about the uh, people-oriented and people-centered approach uh, of ASEAN um, that seems to be a sort of a very very good strategy in the sense that um, as I know from from South Asia that uh, many people know very little about those regional corporations and uh, to many people they seem very remote at best uh, as somewhat detached from people's everyday lives um, I was wondering what what kind of ambitions do you see ASEAN developing in in the future for becoming more sort of people-oriented or people-centric. Um, is this at the level of joint statements or legislation, or are, are there other potentials for f moving in that direction? Uh, thank you. Well, I think, uh, as you mentioned, I, I think you're absolutely correct. The whole idea behind this is to create uh, not only greater awareness, but greater participation of the people of ASEAN in the actual functioning of ASEAN because I think uh, what we uh, want to avoid is to con is to have a, an organization which in which decisions are decided from the top and go to the bottom so I think uh, I think the EU had a has a similar uh, thing and I think ASEAN um, would like now to get more involvement not only of the people civil society but even in in the economic part the small businesses the MSMEs and not only have the big corporations driving the uh, say an economic community so I think the whole idea is to get uh, the involvement of our people in the work of ASEAN and the only way to do that of course is to to make them more aware of what ASEAN is uh, ASEAN now uh, has a population of about uh, 500 to 600 million or somewhere around there and uh, uh, frankly quite a lot are not really aware of what this organization or this grouping is all about so uh, many of the measures being considered of course education uh, and through uh, under the social uh, cultural pillar this is one of the priorities how to bring down to the grassroots level uh, and in the curriculum for example incorporating in each of the member countries something on ASEAN so that the youth uh, can uh, take a greater interest in, in the workings of ASEAN and we also have very uh, a number of youth programs aimed to do this so uh, essentially it's getting the people involved in ASEAN and involving them more I mentioned we're having also more talks with uh, civil society NGOs whenever we can uh, face to face on, on a wide number of issues and so this is really uh, an effort to get uh, basically the whole populations and each of the ASEAN countries involved in ASEAN's work now this will take time but the important thing is that uh, uh, programs and measures are already uh, have already been identified or are already being implemented and that's why when we became chairman we felt uh, that should be one important priority and I'm confident that the succeeding ASEAN chairman we change chairmans every year 
but I think that's already going to be an important part of the work of whoever is chairman of the of the ASEAN. So certainly that uh, that's how we would have to do it. We'll have to work from the the bottom up uh, uh, in order to achieve that. We're gradually approaching the end of the program, but if there's one or two final questions, I'm happy to accommodate those as well. Since that is not the case, I'll thank you all for coming and I'll ask you to give a round of applause to uh, Indra and to Undersecretary Manalo. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you.